Hey guys, welcome to today's podcast. So uh, today we're going to answer a question that came from uh, some of you guys. Actually, this came up several times through email, through through the YouTube, and so on. What's that? So the question is about the stuff, Ed Hart, <laughs> your man. <laughs> The stuff at heart. So, what do they want to know? Well, who's at heart? And who's what's at the stuff? heart? What is the <clears throat> stuff? And uh, do you, did you train in it? All yeah, that stuff. Yeah, just a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, Ed Hart was one of my teachers. Yeah, as a special dude. Uh, I don't even know where to start. He was an uh, incredible man, you know? It wouldn't matter if Ed was, in my opinion, if he taught Kung Fu, which he did. Or if you would have taught baseball or basketball or checkers, it wouldn't matter what Ed was teaching. You would love to learn from him. Um, yeah. Well, some background before I circle back to that. Ed Hart, who was he? He was a second student of Bruce Lee, but he was special long before that. You know, I guess we'll talk about it from a martial art point of view, and then maybe we'll see where it goes, right? From yeah. a martial art point of view, um, Ed... I won't go, because it's kind of personal, and Ed's not here, so rest in peace, so I'm just gonna go a little bit, right? He was bullied a lot as a kid, so, and he was born in 1925 or 1930, right? And Ed got bullied a lot, and when he was 11, I think, he started to learn how to box. He went to a boxing gym and taught him boxing. No, I was actually, no, sorry, before that. He got bullied a lot, he got beat up a lot. One time he was trapped in the back alley and he, he got so scared and closed his eyes and just ran. And then accidentally he ran over a guy, <laughs> the other kid, right? <laughs> he turned around and came back and he gave, returned a favor and all this frustration of all the years of getting bullied by this guy, he unloaded on the guy. And it felt pretty good according to Ed, right? So when he was 11, he started to learn how to box. Eventually, he became a professional boxer. I think he had five or four professional bouts. He won them all within the first round, but he quit because of the migraine headache he was getting from getting punched in the head, right? But even before that, from Chicago all the way to Seattle, he was stopped by every bar he can find, and he was like Batman. He will find a tough guy, douchebag, bully, profile type of guy, and every bar has one or two of those guys. And this is in the 1940s, I guess, or 50s. And then uh, Ed would just, you know, knock them all out. He was a knockout artist, right? Fights were within three seconds. This is not a good thing I'm talking about. I'm just stating where the background he came from. So he had displacement. When you have trauma of getting bullied, automatically you, a lot, a lot of people that get bullied, they get um, really pissed off at bullies, right? So Ed was going around taking revenge and he was just cleaning up hundreds of altercations, never lost, he never lost. And then uh, when he get, became an older guy, he kind of calmed down a bit and he stopped fighting, right? And he never talked about his fights, not once, because he was ashamed of it, because again, that was in a revenge mode, right? The only reason why we know about it is because Jesse won't stop talking about it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Jesse was his best friend for you. Um, so in 1959, Jesse started to train with Bruce Lee, and Jesse was Bruce Lee's first student. And Jesse was a 14-time Northwest Judo champion before he met Bruce, so he's not an average guy, he's incredible. And then after uh, he was learning from Bruce for two months, he asked Bruce, as a favor, can you please teach my friend Ed Hart? And Bruce is like, I don't know about that, because at that time, Bruce was not teaching. He was a dis dishwasher at Ruby Chow's, and he was only training people so he can have someone to train with, right? And <clears throat> But because he liked Jesse a lot, he said, sure, bring him around. And Ed used to tell this story. He met Bruce, and Ed was like over six feet tall, over 200 pounds, professional fighter at one point, hundreds of altercations on the street. The guy was really strong, well-experienced, well-trained, a lot of fighting experience. And here comes this little Chinese guy who was, what, five foot something, 129, 30 pounds at the time, Bruce, glasses on, really good looking kid. And Ed's like, I can't hit this guy. That's what he's thinking, right? Well, I'll never make too much assumption because Bruce is like, all right, do whatever you want. Not, not this, De martial art demonstration you see all the time where everything's scripted. Like, oh, hit me with your left hand. No, hit me with your right hand. 
And also contextually, not like, oh, let's spar or let's do flow drills or let's do chisa. No, nothing like that. Like, realistically, do whatever you want. <laughs> it's like, if I hit people, they don't get back up. So I don't want to do this, right? And Bruce just smiled. He had his hands down. So that threw Ed off. Ed had his hands up. And, and Bruce like, do whatever you want. And he's looking over at Jess, and Jess is smirking. He's like, do whatever you want. So Ed said he went for a move. He got about this far. And he, he said he found himself trapped, and Bruce had a phoenix eye fist on his throat. And being the way Bruce is, he's like, whoa, <laughs> I have a phoenix with one eye. <laughs> Ed walks around the living room. He's, he's grabbing his head. He's like, well, one, he never lost a fight. Two, not in that way. At least it'll last a few seconds, he was thinking, right? So he's walking around the room. Just couldn't believe it. And he always has his hands like that when, it, when he gets emotional, right? And then uh, Jesse's on the floor laughing. And then Bruce goes, would you like to try it again? And this time he got even cockier. He put his hands behind his back. It's like, ah. because I wasn't, you know, I must have telegraphed something. So let me try this again. And Bruce was like, all right. Put his hands behind his back. And then Ed went for it again. Same thing happened. And Bruce did the exact same dick move. He's like, oh. Like, <laughs> now Ed goes crazy, right? And then after he comes down, he's like, hey, can you teach me? And Bruce was like, yeah. And that's how they got started. But because he was such a great fighter with hundreds of victories, and plus he was feeling guilty for his past of fighting so much, he really didn't train much with Bruce, right? I mean, he came around and then Bruce showed him stuff, but, and he couldn't really fuse it into his stuff because his body was already moving a certain manner with certain experience. But, and he did all the homework for Bruce, by the way, in the University of Washington or, or in high school when Bruce was in the tech school in Seattle. You know, nowadays when people look at Bruce Lee magazines or uh, Bruce Lee books and they look at some of the essays that Bruce wrote in Seattle, they was written by Ed. Oh. <laughs> yeah, Ed, Ed had a degree in English literature, right? So, so he was coaching Bruce in English because English was Bruce's second language. He had right. a background in English, but it wasn't really well developed, right? Right, right. Um, so yeah, so the three of them would hang out a lot, Jesse, Bruce, and, and, and Ed, and then they were training. But again, Ed wasn't training that much at the time. Did he pick up like anything from Bruce? Oh, I'm sure he did, but he, uh, he wasn't that serious about training, oh, okay. unlike Jesse, right? Got it. But not only did he have a lot of fighting experience, not only was he a professional boxer, not only did he have hundreds of altercations, not only <coughs> was he a big guy and really strong, this guy also had a lot of courage, more than Bruce. One time they were in a pool hall in Seattle and they were playing pool <laughs> with Jesse and uh, Bruce. And uh, this crazy guy came in and he started throwing pool balls around, which can kill people, right? Yeah, so yeah. he was dropping guys left and right, whipping pool balls around. This guy was a little bit... He's looking around and he's like, well, where the hell is Bruce and Jesse, right? And they were hiding under the table. Bruce Lee was hiding under the table, right? Ed walks up to the guy, balls are flying left and right. He goes, didn't your mother ever tell you not to wear pool balls? And I slap the guy, grab the ball, and goes, get out of here. <laughs> That's the type of guy he was. <laughs> right? And the guy, that guy that was crazy was in shock. Like, he just walked out, right? He reminds me of uh, Kurt Russell's character in Tombstone, right? So it's not about revenge, it's the reckoning. <laughs> That's how, because he suffers so much injustice in his life, he was all about the reckoning, right? So that's an example of how, you know, in Chinese we say, you be like Sam Kung Fu. That means first is physical attribute. Second is courage. Kung Fu and skills loss. Doesn't matter how much skill you have, it's how much courage you have. And Bruce was under the table while Bruce, Ed was walking up to the guy in phase, right? Because he was so damn angry, right? Mm. So this is the type of guy he was. And, um, there's more stories than that, but I, I want to stop here because, again, this gets kind of personal. But just to give you a little bit of a profile, I mean, sure, there's martial artists everywhere, regardless of style, even back in the day. But how many guys have that much world experience and how many guys got that kind of heart, that kind of courage? So when Ed taught something, it wasn't like, hey, man, you know exactly what context he's talking about and you can completely trust this guy. It's none of it is theory. None of it is sparring. None of it is flow drills. None of it is just cheese. So I was like, this guy has done it to people for real. And that gave his student a lot of confidence and a lot of calmness that you can go, all right, I can trust this man, right? So, but 
there was some personal problems later in his life, and he got a, he fell asleep and his cigarette dropped and it burned his apartment down. Right, Jesse kicked the door open, saved Ed, and he was in an ambulance. And they pronounced Ed die. He died for two minutes. Right, he flatline. When he came back, he wanted to change his life, and he's like, "Hey, man." I gotta do something to give back to help people. I can't keep living like this. I wanna teach. But the stuff that I develop with my boxing and street fighting cannot be taught. I mean, you can lace that on top of it. So I wanna get good at martial arts so I can teach it. But unfortunately, when Bruce was around, I didn't train that much, right? So he asked Jesse, he's like, hey, can you teach me? And then Jesse's like, yeah. And then he really taught Je uh, Ed privately, and Ed got really good. Because he had a huge, extensive background, right? And then he ended up teaching his stuff. And he called it his stuff. And I, hey, Ed, why don't you call it something, right? And he said, well, I'm not planning to sell it. The stuff doesn't need a name. And that, that was the first lesson, right? It was like, no, everyone fuss over definitions, names, borders, a fixated way of doing things. But people like that usually have never been in a survival mode. Because if you are in a survival mode, you don't care what country it comes from. You don't care what it is called. You don't care about lineage, you don't care about teachers, you don't care about brand names, you don't care about headbands, you don't care about uniforms. Does it work or not? Can That's you all walk you, away? Yeah. Can I walk away and protect my family? So Ed, then when he say, just call it whatever you want, I just call it the stuff. <laughs> I was like, hey man, this guy, I love this guy, right? You know, a lot of people are gonna wonder what is the stuff? Yeah, we're gonna talk a little bit about that. It's, it's basically, what Jesse taught him, which is preemptive striking, pressure sticking, power hitting, on top of what Ed, he, it rests on Ed's background of his street fighting and his boxing, right? Like, this guy can punch with any angle with neither hand, with extreme short power. Like in five inches, Ed will knock you out. He, he is a knockout artist. There's a lot of punchers in the world, a lot of guys are fast, not powerful. A lot of guys are powerful, not fast. That's why a lot of fighters have to set you up with speed just to finish you with bombs, right? Very few guys are fast and powerful in the exact same moment. And guys that are like that can usually only do it with one hand if you study professional fighters. Probably a couple good punches. Very few got knocked out hands with both hands in any angle and within five inches because it was all designed for the street, right? So Ed had that ability and from Man, training or from fighting? <laughs> I think both. And when he did the Kung Fu, he rested on top of that, right? He never wasted uh, motion. He was so fussy. Even, you know, people talk about half beats and full beat and second beat and blah, blah, blah. But even like a quarter beat, Ed would not waste motion, right? Like one time I did a movement where I snatched, like I checked and I went instead of just going. <laughs> and at the time, he was an old man. I think it was in his uh, mid or late 70s and he had cancer when I met him. And he put his cigarette down and he just, and he goes, Adam! And he got so upset and I was like, yeah, Ed. what I do? what I do, right? <laughs> and he's like, you wasted a beat. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, you did this and you checked when you didn't need to check. Why didn't you just hit the guy? And but wow, man, I, I fucked up, right? And he goes, no. You know, what that, you know what that means? And I was like, well, what does it mean? And he said, well, if you did that, the guy can, and he went off like an entire essay of the possibility of how the guy can school you over a half a beat in a fight, how that can cost you your head if you just wasted one beat of motion in every angle I can think of. And I was like, oh shit. <laughs> so one of the things I got from him was like, don't waste motion. Now everyone talks about this, right? But. Not like Ed. Not like, he dissect the crap out of if, if you went through a combination, you'd be like, all right, let's look at this, right? Let's look at how you overcome the initial inertia. How do you get it flying? What path you went in on? How did you recover from it? How did you get from A to B? What's that mini moment in between? He'll go on about that. He didn't use those terms, but he goes on about that, right? Well, all scientific and... Very scientific. But for him, it was not even scientific. It was just natural from his intuitive ability to knock people out after hundreds of altercation, right? And what I love about him the most is he never talked about his fights and he felt guilty about it. That really was a sign of someone that healed from trauma, right? 
Because you go from like, hey, I'm a victim to, I'm going to take revenge to, I forgive everybody. Even the people that have done this to me. And that's what he went through in his life. Not many fighters get there. A lot of people hold on to it and get darker and darker and darker, right? Right. And this guy was like that. And there were people in his house, two, to, two in the morning, four in the morning, including myself, and uh, he'll talk to you about life. Because he's an old man, right? You go to him for advice. He never wanted anything from us. He would just give us advice. He's always there for us, right? And, yeah. Yeah. You don't find teachers like that. It kind of remind me of Daniel's son, Mr. Miyagi. You know, this guy's just sitting there smoking in his apartment, and all these young guys would come. His house was like, people were in and out all the time and always helping us out with personal problems, right? Like when I met him, I, it was like, I was already training a little bit with Jesse, and Jesse was making hints that I should train with Ed too. And I saw pictures of him since I was like 10 years old, right? I used to, yeah, I used to go to I used to bike to the corner store to get Black Belt magazine and Inside Kung Fu when I was ten years old, and first and second student of Bruce Lee, blah blah blah. And I'll, oh, I'll so cut it, it up. Was a little bit famous too. Oh, just a little bit. He hated fame. Yeah. He he hated. Oh my God, he hated fame. People who would call him like reporters or journalists from Black Belt magazine or whatever. And he'd be like, "Who's this?" He just hangs up. Like he just leave me alone. The only thing I care about is my students. I want them to be good. I'm not here to, it's not about me. Like he was all, like, you know. He probably didn't have that many students though, right? Like, no, it was a very small, tight group. It was like a family, right? Mm. Yeah, you, you don't really see that. Especially like coming from Vancouver, it's like you go to a martial arts school and the commercializations, the vibe is very huge. You're yeah. not looked upon as human a lot of time. You're looked upon as a client. A yeah. customer. They're just trying to sign you, give you a free uniform, get you to sign a contract. And and here comes Ed, right? And when I met him, <clears throat> I'm knocked on the door. And then this old man comes up. He's got a cigarette in his mouth. And the, there's drape, drapes everywhere. And the apartment's really dark. And it's just a cloud of smoke. And I mean, there's no customer service, man. And the guy just got a T-shirt. And he's like, hey. I'm like, you Ed Hart? He's like, yeah. And I was like, would you like me to call you Sifu, Master, Grandmaster? And Ed laughed and goes, call me Supreme Deluxe Grandmaster. And he starts laughing. Because <laughs> then you, you just learn like subtle things like, look, titles don't matter. What kind of asshole gives himself a title? Who calls himself a master? Who would do something that disgusting? That's like picking your nose and kneading it, you know? You can't get, like picking your ass and smelling your finger. Me, 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 I love me. Like, he was... That within the first three seconds I met him, all that martial arts stuff just went out the window. He's a comic supreme deluxe. He was making fun of shit every angle he can get in a nice way. Right? And then you, these subtle lessons were everywhere. That's why I said, look, this guy could have taught checkers. He could have taught baseball, bowling. He could have taught anything. But he, Ed always said the stuff changes people. I don't know why and I don't want to mess with it. I completely disagree with him. Well, it sounds very dumb. It's not the stuff that changes people. It was Ed. He never took credit. Mm. I told him many times, I'm like, you could have took, you could have taught baseball. It's not the stuff, it's you. I had many teachers, but none of them were like you. I mean, there's people, I'll, on my day off, I'll drive from Vancouver to Seattle. And I didn't have a car. I had to borrow my girlfriend's car. We'll drive to Seattle just so I can take him out for grocery shopping because he had trouble walking. He was so old by that time. And then there was people doing that all the time. Like Steve was telling me he was out in a snowstorm, drive there to buy him cigarettes and cream, or Jesse would go out there and clean, you know, and all of us would go and clean his house. Like, I mean, that's because he was so giving to us. He gave a lot more than he ever received. He was always there for us. In his funeral, a lot of his students said, Ed was our best friend. You don't say that to someone that's a client, you know what I mean? Like. There's not many, uh, when I saw Karate Kid and people were talking about how beautiful the relationship is between uh, Daniel Sen and Miyagi, even though the fight scene sucks, but the story's good because of that mentorship, well, that exists real life if you get lucky enough. But I wasn't that lucky. I only spent a short time with him before he passed away. But when he was about to go, he grabbed my hand and he says, if I don't die, I promise to make you good. Holy shit, that made me cry. I mean, they didn't show him when I was in the parking lot, I cried, but I was like, no one gives a shit that much. Not even my dad did, right? Like, definitely not. So this guy was like, he. And in my entire career, I don't care about, that's why I don't read comments on my videos or whatever. Like, I don't care about compliments, right? Or insults. But the only guy I ever cared about was what Ed would have thought. That scared me. Did I fuck up? Because he died 20-something years ago. 
that's when, when Jesse said, hey, if Ed was alive, he would be proud of you. That was the only time that I ever received any rank, any compliment, whatever, that meant something to me. Because that was the only thing I was worried about. To this day, I get worried about, like, hey, if Ed was alive and you saw what I'm doing, it's okay with it, right? It's it's cool. Because even, like, after he passed, Jesse called me and goes, hey, come to Seattle and train, I'll teach you, right? And I'm like, well, that's only because probably Ed made you promise him, right? (laughs) I never went back to Seattle to train after Ed passed, right? But he was a very special guy. If there were more teachers like that in the world, whether it's high school or in any walk of life, I think young people would benefit greatly. Yeah. Yeah, like when I'm when I'm about to be an asshole or when I'm being an asshole, and then that Ed comes through my mind, right away I feel about this big and I stop. Right. He had that effect on everyone that knew him, even Jesse. Like, you know, even Bruce. Bruce loved him. Like, he, he was just a... Because there's a difference between a guy being nice to you and a guy that can kick your ass being nice to you. One's weak, one's compassion. He doesn't want anything from you. There's no agenda. This guy just... There's so much ass-kicking in his life, he just wants to give back. And everyone thinks he's a tough guy, but no, this guy was a legitimate as tough as they come, man. And he went from Chicago to Seattle just kicking ass. <laughs> In the ring and outside the ring, you know? So, anyways. That's quite the legacy. Oh, yeah, but it kind of reminds me of the the Buddhist thing of that more, like, you know, with the sazen and the meditation and the qigong and all this stuff. He says, those who come to the Dharma comes with great suffering. There has been a history of this stuff. If we're going to sidestep a little bit into Qigong and meditation, there hasn't been any accomplished masters that came without great suffering. All of them had a hard life. A normal person doesn't just renounce everything and go study meditation. Something bad had to happen. Normal people just treat it like a hobby. Download an app, do 10 minutes every two weeks to relieve some stress. But when someone go to really make a life out of it, something, you don't take medicine unless you've been sick before, right? So... So Ed was a really good example of how somebody that had a hard life can heal and then pay it forward and help people and make them heal. Like to me, he was a brilliant teacher. Sounds like the full hero's journey there, man. Yeah, he didn't, he definitely, if you said that to Ed, he'll probably <laughs> just throw up in his mouth and laugh. I mean, but I, we all saw him like that, but he, he never did, right? And, he, and the funny thing is, when he got old, no matter where we were, he was spending a lot of effort avoiding tough guys. Mm-hmm. I remember that there was a time he would go out of his way to look for tough guys so he could knock them out. Right? And when he was an old man, he felt so enormously guilty about that. And he was always giving a shit if we have any bit of spikes in our mood where he's like, hey, calm down, don't hurt people. Like he was really, yeah, I love the guy, man. Any other questions? That's it for now, man. Thanks for that. No, thank you. Bring him up. Yeah, it's nice to think about him. Yeah. All right. See you guys. Next time, guys.